But then I realized something, that the term resistance itself is not helpful and that it is mostly a label that we use to blame other people for our inability as leaders to shape their behavior, to influence their behavior. Welcome everyone to Culture by Design. I have joining us today, actually a longtime colleague and friend, Marcelino Sanchez. And I'm delighted to welcome him to the podcast. Marcelino, welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Said. Pleasure to be here. Let me say a word about Marcelino. He's the managing principal at Agilitize, an organizational change and OPEX practitioner, trainer, and coach. His project portfolio includes change management capability building, strategy deployment, M&A, corporate transformations, deploying lean Six Sigma, union management partnerships, employee engagement, and implementing operating systems, among others. He's coached managers and change agents at all levels, including CEOs, executive teams, project teams, and task forces. Before that, and I won't be able to cover everything, but before that, he worked at Textron as a global manager in change management, and then before that at Bell Helicopter, where he worked in, in several roles, including as a Six Sigma black belt. He holds a master's degree in organizational behavior from Brigham Young University. And he has worked with clients across a number of industries. So Marcelino, I'm delighted and honored that you would join us for the podcast. I'm excited. So we've known each other a while, haven't we? A long time, Tim. And I, I can't even remember how we came across each other, but it's been a long time. That's how long it's been. It has. It's been a long time. Let's begin this way. Share a little bit about your story. So you came to this country at what, what age? I was 16. I was in the middle of my junior year. Okay. And I'll tell you what, to talk about change, that was major change for me. It was a total change of my world, of my identity. I, everything changed for me. And uh, so that was really one of the seminal experiences with change that kind of eventually took me into the field of change management, culture change, and all of that. Do you think stuff. that had an impact on your career choice? Oh, absolutely. Do you really? Absolutely, yes. So take, so, take, us, take us back to that a little bit. So you're 16 and you're coming from Mexico. Take us back and help us understand what that was like just a little bit. Well, let, let me backtrack just a little bit. So in Mexico, so I, you know, when I was a little, a little boy, I was very reserved, very insecure. And it took me a long time. And my mother helped me to become more comfortable with myself. By the time I, I was in high school, I entered high school, I was a very well-adjusted individual, right? I was in a basketball team. You wouldn't believe it if you saw my size, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but this is this is in Mexico after all, right? So, and I had a great group of friends, and uh, I was thriving yeah. socially, academically, you know, at, at a personal level. And then my dad decides, let's go to the United States. That's a whole other story. But when we came here, it was in the middle of my junior year. It wasn't mm. even during the summertime. I left the school where I was at, at Christmas time, and I never went back. I transitioned to the U.S. I got here in uh, early March, and I get thrown into a new environment. I felt invisible because nobody would talk to me, not because they didn't want to, but because they didn't know how to interact with me. I couldn't speak English, even you though I was not. could not speak English. No, no. I had taken English classes in Mexico because everybody has to take English classes outside of the U.S., right? And I was an ace student in English, and yet I couldn't even really put a, sentence, a coherent sentence together. So you dropped into oh. new society, new school, new high school, right? Yeah, new high school. So here you are, you're sitting in a class. Yeah, yeah. What, what was that like? It was very depressing, to be honest, and uh, it changed everything. I didn't have any friends. 
I went back to square one in terms of my insecurities came right back out mm. and I had to start from square zero, right? So that was really difficult. So the first 18 or so months were extremely difficult for me, but eventually I bounced back and I served a, as a missionary for my church. And during that time, I also became very interested in the process of change, of how people change, would change their, not only their beliefs, but also their social circles, their mm-hmm. their uh, habits. And that was really fascinating to me. So those two experiences were very important in my development. I want to take you back a little bit because I remember a conversation that you and I had some time ago, mm-hmm. and we were talking about cultures. And as we know, we can even bounce from culture to culture in the course of a single day, right? A microculture that might exist at home. Yes. And then at work or school. And I remember you telling me that in the course of a single day, back in high school, you'd go to school, no one would talk to you, you didn't have any friends, you're still learning English, but then you made the, I think it was the cross-country team. Yeah. So tell us about that and how, so you went from classroom to then the cross-country team, and then I remember you saying, and then after that, I went to- To work. To work. Yes. So take us through that because it was microculture <laughs> to microculture to microculture. And each one had a different level or degree of belonging and attachment yes. and connection. Absolutely. I'm surprised that you remember me mentioning that to you, but uh, you're, you're right. You know, at school, I felt like an invisible man, like an invisible person. And very, very unimportant to anybody. My health teacher happened to be the cross-country coach, and he saw me a couple of times running to work because I had to run by the track, the school track, where, where the team was uh, would practice uh, you know, during the track season because he was also the track coach. And he, he would see me running, and I would run. You were running stuff, where? To work. To work. work? Yeah, so I would go home, and then from home, I would do my homework real quick and then go to work. It was a good, probably two mile. And, and I you would, would run, run to work. I would run to work. I just like running, I guess. And But I, it had never occurred to me to join the track team or the cross country team. And then he invited me to join. <laughs> You'll laugh at this. The first time I ran with him, I was wearing basketball shoes. Uh, except, except yeah. I, didn't know, I didn't know that there sure. was such thing as running shoes, right? Sure. So I joined the team. And that time it was during the spring. And so I started running with him. And I began to excel. I wasn't the fastest guy, but I was not the slowest by any stretch. Mm-hmm. And that changed everything for me because all of a sudden I had a, I belonged to a, not only to a team, but also because I was not the slowest. I was among the top five fastest runners, long distance runners. All of a sudden I, I became a member of a community. I was able to break through the uh, one mile under five minute, you know, club. And, and that was a big deal for me. I didn't know that that was a thing. I mean, I didn't know that that was like a benchmark or anything. And um but that kind of gave me access to to people that I didn't have before in the track team. It was a community. As a small, community. Small, small, but yeah, nevertheless small. a community and you right. gained membership, access. Yes. Correct. Correct. And so that was a different experience in a different microculture than going to school to classes, right? Just Where, school, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was very different. And then at work... My father had a, a Mexican restaurant, and we had to work. There was no choice. We came and uh, and we were working there. And I remember, I started, you know, washing dishes. There's nobody to talk to there. Just you know, just to, to the work. And I was used to working very hard anyway. Uh, and then I I went to the kitchen, and everybody spoke Spanish in the kitchen. I mean, so I was in my element there, and I like working hard. I like the you know the challenge of a very busy. Friday night or Saturday night and just working really hard. But then my dad said, okay, now you, you need to go and, and be a server. Now that was different because now I had to interact in English with people, with people that were very different from me. But here's the interesting thing. As a server, you have authority vested in you by virtue of you being the guy who, who takes the order. Right. And you bring it, you know, whenever you bring it. And, you know, people are sort of a, you know, they depend on you. Right. While they are there, they depend on you. Right. You create the experience. You create the experience. Exactly. And so for me, 
it became almost like a stage to act in a way and behave in a way that I knew I liked that was different from school, Mm -hmm. that was also different from the track team. And so that was a really good, it was sort of a laboratory for me to experiment with things. So, So for instance, I would experiment with smiling and making people smile, making people laugh by saying something funny. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I could try different things and I learned that some things work better than others. And that was really, really good for me. And because I thought of it as a stage, you know, I, thought of it as, I thought of it as acting, then it was safe. Mm-hmm. And they gave me the permission to do so because that's what they expect. They expect a server to do their own thing, right? To be their own little you know, number right there and then in the in a few minutes that we interact with the customer. Yeah, yeah. Such an amazing case study in cultures because I'm thinking of concentric circles. I'm thinking of four rings, mm-hmm. right? So you have this innermost ring, which is your family, mm-hmm. your microculture that represents your family. And then, and so if that represents maybe the deepest level of intimacy and the strongest level of connection. Right. And then the next ring is the restaurant. Yeah. Where that's the next deepest connection and level of intimacy. And then the next ring would be the cross country team. Right. And then the outer ring might be school. Mm -hmm. And we could go from there. Right. But it's so fascinating that you are operating and toggling back and forth from the, among these different microcultures. And this is a period of trying to assimilate and trying to integrate into a new society. And so now you're right. saying, Marcelino, that you can look back and say, it definitely had a direct and profound impact on my career choice. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, some, going back to those concentric circles that you're referring to, the nice thing, you know, the thing about all of this is that we can influence that. And that's something that I didn't realize early on, that I could influence culture in a very tactical and a very immediate way. So at the restaurant, for instance, you know, there's only a handful of servers at any given time. And my actions would create an experience for the customer. And if I repeat that multiple times, and if I can influence other employees to do the same, we can definitely change the customer experience. Mm-hmm. And that's that I think that can be true anywhere. And so we can definitely impact microculture in a very real way by the way we behave, by how we treat others. And, and so even though our behavior and my behavior was different from at school, and if, you, if people would see me at school, they would not think that I was the same person that they saw in the restaurant because I was very outgoing, I was smiling, but at school, I would be very aloof, not very social. Mm-hmm. The thing is that we still have our our core, right? Our core values or our core self, whatever you want to call it. And that is, is still a driving, a driving force for all of us. And that's something that I think we need to be also mindful of because it also drives behavior. You know what's amazing though, at 16 or 17, whatever you were, you discovered that you could influence culture at least the immediate culture around you. And that takes us into a, an interesting fact about culture. Culture as a variable is, in research, as we both know, it's both an independent and a dependent variable. We shape culture, but we in turn are shaped by, by culture. culture. Yes. So it's an X and a Y. And you discovered as a teenager <laughs> that you could be an independent variable that could shape culture. That's really interesting. It's really amazing that you came to that conclusion and that insight at such a young age. Well, to be honest, I didn't think of it that way back then, but it wasn't very long after that that I I reflected on those experiences as I started college and so forth and uh, decided that that was an area that I wanted to explore and eventually become a practitioner. Mm -hmm. So let's transition to your role as a practitioner. You've been working in this field for, well, the years have added up, right, Marcelino? That's right. We've been doing this for a while now. (laughs) That's right. In the conversation that you and I had before, I asked you if you could identify some 
gems, some gold nuggets that you could share with us based on your accumulated experience. So you could sift through and comb through your experience with all of these different organizations, client organizations across many, many industries and harvest that experience a little bit and bring us some insights. So let's talk about that. Sure. Let me first uh, provide a, a little bit of context. So my background, and you mentioned, I studied organizational behavior at BYU. I also studied marriage and family therapy about the same time. I actually overlapped by a, a year in my two master's programs. As an undergraduate, I studied social psychology. So I was very always very interested in people, in the social aspect of behavior and so forth, as well as uh, you know how systems cultural systems and other systems shape our behavior. When I started my career, and you mentioned Bell Helicopter, a great company to work for, I very quickly got thrown into some very technical roles, not technical roles, but in some very technical environments. For instance, project management in the context of IT and engineering project management, very, very technically driven people, technically mindsets or technical mindsets. And then from there, I went into the world of Lean and Six Sigma. And most of the, no, most of my peers were engineers, of course. Not all of them, but most of them. And here I am, I'm feeling like, a, like the odd duck of the family there because I am not an engineer. And, and yet I'm doing all these, participating in all this work. Uh, <laughs> you, projects. Arrive. you arrive with two master's degrees. One in organizational behavior and the other in, in family therapy, right? Well, the family therapy, I actually never quite finished. That's another story altogether, but- the, But here uh, I am, I'm ready to help. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to help. <laughs> I actually finished all the coursework, but when uh, I knew that I didn't want to be a clinician. Uh -huh. I knew that I wanted to go into, the, into large organizations. And uh, even though I finished almost everything, I decided to go into, into industry. And um, to the chagrin of my professors in the, in the other program, but- but anyway, so here I am with all of these theories and concepts around people and society and, and systems and all this, playing the role of, of the most people who think of were the realm of engineers, Six Sigma, Lean, project management, earned value management, mm -hmm. you know, some very technical things. But I was able to combine all of those things because something that I learned very quickly was that it doesn't matter what you do. If the organization isn't actually changing, I don't care how many, how much technology you throw at a problem. I don't care how, how much you communicate and train people on how to use you know, this tool and that tool. It is not going to make a difference. So having realized that very early on in my, in my career, I decided to specialize in change management. And that's something that I wanted to do since I came out of grad school already. But so... In terms of gems, so one thing that I very quickly learned is that somebody said to me once when I was getting some uh, change management training, people don't resist change. What they resist is being changed. And that, that kind of made sense. And the more, I, I, the more experience I got in this whole area of organizational change, that truism was always there. But then I realized something, that the term resistance itself is not helpful and that it is mostly a label that we use to blame other people for our inability as leaders to shape their behavior, to influence their behavior. And so when we use the term resistance, I think it's very unhelpful because all we're doing is blaming someone else. And of course, you know this, blaming not only does it not get the job done, it actually creates new problems. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we say, oh, people resist change or people don't want to change or, you know, so-and-so is a resistor, we're not only not being helpful, we are actually creating another problem. So I've come to look at resistance, not as a, in fact, I don't even use that term very, not very often at all. I think of resistance in three ways. One is what you, what you might call, what we might call cultural rejection, number two, organizational inertia, and number three, organizational or systemic gravity, systemic gravity. Those three things are, I think, distinct. I think they need to be understood because unless we understand them, 
all we're doing is just blaming others by saying, well, they are resisting change. They don't like to change it. They refuse to change. And then we end up relying on mandates and telling people what to do and communication yeah. plans and all this, which really doesn't deliver change. Well, we shift and change moves on to a compliance track exactly. instead of a commitment track, right? Right. But I love what you said. Let's go back to what you said. If we focus too much on resistance, it's an excuse. It's this residual category. And we can just blame everything on resistance. Right. But what is resistance? It's not its own entity. It's the way people think and feel uh -huh. about what's happening. And there are reasons for that, as you... There are reasons for that, yes. And, and some of those are internal, but many of them, in fact, I would say most of them are external. Let me give you an example. And I like to do this demonstration in workshops, right? I put my hand up and I ask somebody else to give me their hand, to put their, their palm against mine. And without telling them, I start pushing. And of course, the natural reaction is to push back. <laughs> right. Right. And it happens every single time. So as I push and I push a little bit harder, they push harder. And then I ask, okay, so what's this person doing? And almost always people say, well, they are resisting. And then I ask, okay, well, are they really resisting or are they just reacting? And of course, the point is that, that people react to the stimuli mm -hmm. or to the stimulus that they feel, right? Right. And oftentimes, leaders, the way they, I just got done talking to a client just now before this, the way they are positioning what they're trying to do sounds like a top down, you know, we're going to cram it down your throat approach. Right. And whenever, and I know that's not what they intend. Whenever people perceive that, guess what they're going to do? They're going to start pushing back. Not because they're resisting, but because it's a natural reaction, right? Or as Newton would say, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's not necessarily negative. No, it's just a response. It's a response, at least initially. Initially, right. right. Okay. So initially, and then what happens is, I think the typical counter response of the leader is to push harder. That's right right? When they see any quote-unquote resistance or when they see any sluggishness in people, they're almost always a, the reaction or the counter-reaction of the leader is to double the, to redouble the effort. In other words, to say it again or to say it louder and communicate more as if that's going to do it. And of course, we right. know that that doesn't work. That's not going to work. <laughs> so understanding the nature of resistance. So usually... There may be that initial pushback, but there's so much that we can do to remove the resistance to yes. redirect the response in a different way. Right. right. Well, I mean, what most people want is to feel like they matter, like they are meaningful to the organization. And one way, during times of change, one way to do that is in, to invite them to get involved. When we are involved, we can become the co-authors of the change as opposed to being the victims of the change. Right. And so I advocate for early involvement and meaningful involvement. And so that's one way that people can get over some of that early response that says, I'm not quite ready. And if you push me, I'm never going to be ready. Right. So, so that's so one want, way to get over that. I want to underscore the point that you've made, Marcelino. I think it's critical to invite people in to co-author the change. Yeah. Even if we know where we want to go and we say, here's the current state, here's the future state, here's the vision, here is the portrait of the future that we yes. think we're moving towards. Even if we have that planned and we have a pretty clear idea of where we're going, the reality is that on the ground, we still have to figure things out as we go. Exactly. We need some co-authors. That's, exactly. that's the reality. You're not going to do the detailed planning. You're going to do the strategic planning, maybe the high-level planning yep. of current state to future state, but you don't have those details figured out. Exactly. And inviting people to the detail that's party, right. right? That's where the opportunity is. And, and, you know, and there's great wisdom and great benefit to that. It Not only does it, do you get the buy-in, right, that people are always after, but also you get the ideas and the know-how of the people that actually know their stuff and that know how the organization works 
at that level of the organization. And that's very valuable. That is a gem. Yeah. That is a gem. Invite others to co-author change. You're going to need the co-authors anyway. Yes. People resist having change done to them. To them. They want to be a part of it. They want to make a meaningful contribution. Yes. They want to collaborate. Right. And, you know, I think most people know that organizations are not a democracy, right? That they have to live with certain things, you know, with certain conditions. But when they feel like a victim of change, nobody likes that. But if they are able to, to at least help and become involved in some of that detail planning, right? So how, how is this going to look like in my organization or in, yeah. in our area? That much can make a big difference. Well, I think we've just got to be honest. When we do organizational change, especially large scale, nonlinear change, we may have uh, good plans about where we're going, as I said, and why. Mm -hmm. And we may have made a compelling case. Yeah. We may have that, but we never know how, at least completely. Right. We may have the broad contours laid out. We may understand that, but we don't know at a tactical level how it's all going to work. We never do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and that brings us to another potential gem, right? Which is uh, this notion of organizational agility for change. Some years ago, I, I realized, and it's something that I think most of us in the field have known for a long time, that the field of change management has not changed very much <laughs> in and of itself. We're still using old notions of unfreeze, change, and then refreeze, mm -hmm. or this, uh, this notion of plan change. But the truth is, a lot of organizations nowadays exist in an ever-changing, always in motion environment. And so that's another reason to invite more people to become involved because they're the ones, not only do people know a lot of what needs to change and what needs to improve, but they are also the main implementers. Mm -hmm. And so when we invite people and when we create, and I love the work that you're doing in the, in the area of psychological safety, when we create those environments where people can be vulnerable and can be safe, can feel safe to be vulnerable, they can come and contribute in ways that enable the organization to change very rapidly and very organically. And that's true organizational agility. You know, I think we talk a lot about agile project management and all of this, but outside of project work, just day-to-day -day interactions can be much more agile if we create the environment for people to come and contribute, come and be themselves and provide the ideas that will move the organization forward, especially once the, the strategy and the vision and, the, and all of that are crystal clear. Uh, that, that has to be clear mm -hmm. uh, for people. Well, what I hear you saying, Marcelino, is that this is cultural. This has to be cultural. So, for example, it's not about, speaking of agile, particularly, this is not about doing your scrum and your sprint. Although that may be important to use, for example, agile tools and methodology, but we're talking about the cultural attributes of infusing agility into the organization, into the DNA, into the mindset, into the approach, into the expectations that people have. Yeah, exactly. It's a dynamic environment. It is. It is. You are correct. It has to be part of the culture. I would also say it also has to be part of the system itself. Your structures, the processes, the policies, the procedures have to become simpler so that they can also reinforce organizational agility. So you have to have both a leadership mindsets and cultural values and organizational systems that support agility. So just to build on your point about simplicity, do you run into just unnecessary complexity in the process? <laughs> That's I a dumb swim, question. <laughs> I swim in it, uh, Jim. You swim in it. <laughs> Sorry for asking uh, the question, I guess it's everywhere, but what is working to combat that, to fight that, to prune that back? Because one of the things that I've learned, Marcelino, we've both learned it over the years, is that organizations left to themselves naturally proliferate. Yes. They don't prune themselves. Yes. 
they don't pare back, right? right? They don't take out the overgrowth and the undergrowth. Yes. They just keep growing and we keep adding things. We keep adding structure and systems and processes and policies and procedures and it goes right. on and on. Yeah. And if we don't clear that out, then there's this accumulation and it becomes a real problem. Well, let me give you a perfect example. And this is, I think this is true in most organizations. And then I'll answer the questions to how do we combat that? Or I'll give you my, my answer. Metrics and indicators, right? A corporate dashboards and, or, or uh, scoreboards, whatever you want to call them. Most organizations have a collection, right, of an evolution of metrics that have existed for a long time, right? Somebody some time ago said, I need to know this and I need, to, I need to know it in this format and I need to know it this, you know, in this frequency. And it became a standard report and a standard metric that gets reported. And over time, we've added and added and added. And now most organizations have disjointed, you know, a series of metrics, not only disjointed, but but that in many cases are at odds with one another, yeah, competing with one another, that are reinforcing every metric reinforces a behavior. Every single metric reinforces a behavior. And when you have a proliferation of metrics, you have to ask yourself, okay, are we creating a cacophony of expectations because we're measuring all these things that, are, that may not be aligned? Mm -hmm. In most instances, the answer is yes. I cannot think of a single example where I've seen a clean set of metrics. At the top level of the organization, every <laughs> executive will tell you, yeah, of yeah. course we have clean metrics. Well, yeah, for them, they're clean. But all the related things that those clean metrics create down through the organization and all the metrics that they support is anything but clean and anything but connected. And so I think one simple thing that can combat that proliferation that you're talking about is asking us a very simple question. Why? Why are we doing this? Why are we measuring this? Why are we measuring it this way? I worked with a an executive team once, a long time ago, it was interesting that for profit margin, operating margin, they had, they all, every executive, not every executive, they had about three or four different numbers. So the number that I was given by the CFO and that I posted on a flip chart to, for discussion, right off the bat, people started to disagree. Oh, that's not the number I have. Well, what number do you have? Well, I have this. Well, what number do you have? And pretty soon we realized we had, there were, there were like three or four different numbers because they were not only was it a different calculation, they, they were making different assumptions as to what went into the number and why you know that number needed to be so. And yet, you know, here's the, the top leadership team of the CEO, right, operating with starkly different assumptions about what profit margin was all about. Mm -hmm. And and of course they were driving their different organizations to those numbers or calling them accountable to those numbers. It was incredible. It is incredible. So let's go back. So this is a gem. Agility for change, but agility translates into simplicity. Yes. And simplicity implies an active role to keep things clean and tight. So that means going back. So for listeners out there, think about this. Look at your metrics. Look at your, whatever you call them, your KPIs, your OKRs, your scorecard, your dashboard, whatever it is. Look at all your metrics and evaluate them based on their evolution. Some of you have first generation metrics. Okay, that's great. They are current, they are clean, they are tight, they are hopefully measuring what you want to measure. But how many of you have second gen, third gen, fourth gen, fifth gen metrics that you're still measuring, you're still gathering, you're still reporting, and it becomes, Marcelino, as you say, a cacophony, which means noise. Yeah. How do you know where to go? You've got metrics that are at cross purposes. And so you are not able to manage the business as well as you could because you really, if you have too many metrics, then it is as if you have no metrics. How do you prioritize? How do you run triage? How do you allocate resources? Yeah, correct. And in some cases, Again, one of the, the one question is why are we measuring that? And that, that that one question applies to anything, right? Why are we doing it this way? 
but also what what behavior is this in the case of metrics what behavior is this reinforcing because you know it's reinforcing something it's reinforcing something always yeah. right so you know uh, in another experience we you know th- there was a huge problem in the supply chain area and they were not delivering on time and they were delivering the wrong thing and this were like complex pieces of equipment for construction sites big deal right because a single a single miss could could put a uh, or a single you know teeny part could put the whole project on pause big deal and what we discovered was that the upstream when the salesperson was making the sale because they were being measured and they were the metric that they used was you know uh, closing the sale and making revenue they making the revenue number for that quarter well guess what they were doing they were closing sales they were closing sales that were they didn't have complete technical requirements and what that was creating was noise down the down the system right because they entered the order through their ERP system and then sometime down the line somebody realized wait a minute we don't have all the customer requirements all the technical requirements we need to open a a change order mm-hmm. and you know and that created a whole slew of work that resulted in downstream right at the point of delivery it resulted in delayed shipments in uh, shipments with the wrong parts etc big problems all because the metric that we were using was reinforcing a behavior of let's close the sale now to make the revenue so i think we need to based on this discussion based on this second gem marcelino i think we can distill out an insight which is here we are in the era of big data right yeah we measure more things in more ways than ever before but that's not always good not unless so we need to understand the downside liability of so many metrics yes when it proliferates some at some point you reach diminishing returns and then it becomes counterproductive because you have metrics that are at cross purposes you're creating perverse incentives and people don't know what to do right and so on some kind of consistent basis at some regular interval we need to revisit what we're measuring how we're measuring it why we're measuring it and the operating assumption is that we've got to get rid of some of that some of that's over time is going to become redundant or obsolete or trivial or flat out harmful yes yes and that applies not only to metrics that applies to anything right a process or a procedure or a policy policies is that a good example of proliferation so simplification is so important and when you think about simplification in the context of the entire system then i think that's what can create organizational agility that is hard to do by training alone or even by behavior leadership behavior leadership behavior is so important too yeah. i think those two things are so critical great leader behavior and also simplicity in the system to enable change to happen i think another thing that gets in the way marcelino is that we don't normally reward that behavior when was the last time someone came to a team meeting with great enthusiasm and excitement and said I'm so excited to share with everyone that we're going to stop measuring this. <laughs> right? right? We're right. not rewarded for the things that we stop doing. Yes. And we don't have the start stop continue exercises often enough, but we should. Yes. And we should be pretty excited when we can do some pruning, do some trimming, take out the overgrowth because Inevitably, it comes back to the principle that you're talking about, and that is agility at some level relies on simplicity because the simplicity preserves the clarity. Yes. Once we lose the clarity, we're in trouble. Yes, exactly. You know, your comment about rewarding the right behavior is so also very important because that, you know, I, earlier I talked about inertia, right? The organizational inertia, part of that inertia comes from the fact that we are rewarding things that we was rewarded. And so, for instance, firefighting, right? You know, if somebody tackles an emergency and they're the hero, and the more they do it, the more they get rewarded for being a hero. But people who are 
for instance, simplifying, taking out waste out of a system or out of a process that hardly ever gets publicized. No, it doesn't hardly ever get. You don't get credit for that. You don't get credit for that. No. But at the end of the day, that's what you want. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's unheralded work, and yet it's so important. We sometimes, we often reward the dysfunctional behavior that is killing us. We do. But we, we reward that. Yeah, yeah. That's a beautiful gem. Do you have one more for us, Marcelino? So one more would be, you know, and you, I think you already mentioned it, and it's uh, this notion of clarity. It's almost like, you know, okay, you, but nobody can disagree with that. And it's such a simple concept. But clarity is so important every single day. You know, some, oftentimes we talk about clarity in a very big way, like, you know, we need to be clear about our mission and our vision and our strategy. And that's important. But from day to day, there are some things that we can do to create clarity within the organization. So for instance, I just, <laughs> a long ago, I attended a, a client meeting and it wasn't clear to me where the discussion was going. And so we encounter those, those types of interactions, I think very frequently, almost every day, right? And meetings is a good example of where this comes out. Conversations that are like just going around in circles and it's not very clear. So again, just asking a very simple question like, what's the problem that we're trying to solve here, mm-hmm. right? Or what's the outcome that we would like to achieve? Once that becomes clear, then the how is easy. And sometimes we get stuck in the how, right? And we talk about the how in circles without being clear about why it is that we're here or what is it that we're trying to accomplish. And so, you know, oftentimes when I work with clients, for instance, somebody will call me and say, hey, we're having this retreat or this board meeting, can you help us? Inevitably, the first question I ask is, okay, and you know, what's the purpose of the meeting and what would you like to accomplish? Almost never, Tim, do I get a one word or a one sentence, clear sentence answer to that question. Why? Because more often than not, the sponsoring executive hasn't really thought it through. They know they need to have this thing because it happens every year. They know they need to involve X, Y, and C people because they always invite them. But when they haven't, oh, and they may have a series of topics that they would like to address. But when it comes to to answering the question, a simple question like, okay, so what's the purpose and what are you trying to get out of this? Mm -hmm. And how would you know that you've accomplished the purpose? That they struggle. And you would think that (laughs) would be so fundamental, right? Well, it is fundamental. (laughs) It is fundamental. But yet we don't do it very well. No, that's right. That's right. (laughs) The power of simple clarity is so important and yet so. I think, undervalued or underestimated. So let's think about the unintended consequences of not having the clarity. So if we don't have the level of clarity that we need at one level, as we move down through the organization, it just gets worse. Yes. So a little bit of misalignment at the top translates into severe misalignment by the time we get to the bottom of the organization. Correct. Is that not true? Oh, yeah. The noise gets amplified, right? The confusion gets amplified Mm -hmm. the further down you go in the organization. So it's critical. Two things I think are critical. One is clarity at the top or what I would call the epicenter of the action. And number two, that line management in in, in the middle of the organization act as um, they act as the medium to which clarity gets reinforced because inevitably there's going to be some dissonance, some lack of understanding from level to level. And that's why it's important for mid-level managers to one, get clear on themselves so that they can then clarify and keep that dissonance or that amplification of confusion to its minimum. This is such an interesting topic because it's everywhere. So if the signal to noise ratio is not that good on top, By the time you get to the bottom, you're swimming in ambiguity. You don't have line of sight understanding concerning what you're doing. So what are you going to do? You have no choice other than to try to figure it out the best that you can, make some assumptions, allocate yourself based on what you think is most important. But inevitably, people are going to be doing different things. Yes. And so the clarity, the job of creating and communicating the clarity I think, Marcelino, is never done. I agree it's with you. It's never done. It's never done because something is always happening and in inviting confusion into the mix, right? So 
the job of, I think, of the leader and the manager is to always be sifting through the noise and making sure that, that there's clarity around what people need to know. Now, here's another thing that I think gets in the way. You, you reflect on your own experience and you tell me what you think. But we are so deeply socialized in organizations to have a bias for action. Yes. That oftentimes we'll get in a meeting and we will address issues the best that we can, but we don't have the clarity. We are still short of clarity, but we are anxious to get out there and get things done. Right. That we actually leave the meeting without the clarity and we we go out and execute. Yes. Now that sounds ironic. It seems <laughs> almost impossible, but we do that, don't we? So it's that bias for action. Where, where are you going? I'm going to execute. Oh, great. What are you going to execute? Well, the things that we talked about. Okay, did we come to absolute clarity and alignment? No, but we're executing. Yeah. You yeah. see that? We're going nowhere fast, right? You're right. You know, what I see, for instance, a lot is where this uh, uh, shows itself a lot is in problem solving. We are so quick to start with solutions before we even understand what the problem is. Right. In most cases, I find that you know, uh, you know, a group of executives or or a, or a task force, they don't really understand the real issue, and therefore, they want to. On they want, they want to start solutionizing and, and actionizing everything, and that takes them to to Abilene, right? You know, you know the Abilene paradox. Yeah, and, the and, and, Abilene paradox. <laughs> right. It's, it's this illusion. <laughs> I didn't of want agreement. to go. I didn't want to go there, but everybody went because of this illusion of agreement. And so, yeah. but you're right. It's our our socialization of being task oriented that pushes in that direction. And that happens in every organization. Yeah. yeah. So clarity is so important. It is. Absolutely priceless gems here, Marcelino. Yeah. Do you have any concluding? Well, let, let me do this. I want to kind of recap or summarize sure. the gems a little bit for our listening audience. So here's what I have. Number one, invite others to co-author change. Otherwise, they feel that change is being done to them. Right. And they may be passive, they may be resistant, they may they may become passive aggressive, they may be agitators, they may try to sabotage what's being done. All kinds of things could happen. Or simply check out and stay. Or right? check become, out. Become dead weight. Yeah. Yeah. Check out. So number one, invite others to co-author change. You need them anyway for implementation because you don't have it figured out anyway. Right. Let's be honest. Yes. Number two, create agility for change with an emphasis on simplicity. Simplicity, yes. With the assumption that that job is never done and the second assumption that organizations naturally proliferate and you're going to have to pare back Yes. The processes and systems and primarily what we talked about, metrics. Yes. Where we get metrics on top of metrics on top of metrics. Yeah. So that's number two. And then number three, create clarity. So you're taking us back to first principles. Create clarity in terms of the what and the why. If you why? have clarity on the what and the why, we can figure out the how. It may not be easy. Yeah. But if we don't have clarity on the what and the why, we can't figure out the how. It's so we have to start with that. And it may be a little painful. We may not have it, but we have to impose the discipline until we have the what and the why before we're going anywhere. We're not passing go. Right. We're not doing that. Right, right. So that's kind of a summary. So what would you add to that, Marcelino? You know, when you think about clarity, uh, to play on that last uh, point, when you think about clarity, it is very similar to simplicity, right? Because both of them create the wherewithal to act in ways that are nimble and agile. You know, when people are confused, when people don't have, when there's complexity, when they're in a, in a complex environment, unnecessarily complex, it is hard to be agile. It's hard to act autonomously or confidently, even within a structure. And so those two, I think, are very, I would say, cousins to each other, clarity and simplicity. They really are. And so so to close, I think the leader has a great opportunity, any leader. And by the way, I'm not talking here about opposition. As you know, you know this is 
something that anybody can do that influences other people. Something that we can all do is simplify things and create clarity in order to create agility and hopefully also create the environment for change to happen more organically without the typical resistance that people often associate with change. And, and I think you know a simple example of creating simplicity and clarity is, again, in our interactions, in a simple email. Hey, the reason I'm asking this question is because, clarify, rather than, you know, I, I think email back and forth is a good example of complexifying <laughs> things, right, and creating confusion. Pretty soon after the 10th reply, you're wondering, I have no idea how we got to this point, and I don't even know what, what we're talking about. Right. It happens in email exchanges. It happens in, you know, one-on-one interactions. It happens in meetings all the time. It happens in staff meetings or project reviews. So those are all examples of inviting or introducing simplicity and clarity to hopefully create agility. I love that. Those two are cousins, right? Which is clarity, my cousins. <laughs> clarity and simplicity are cousins. Yep. They give you the opportunity to create the agility that you need and ultimately working all the way backwards from in our discussion. Those are the things that neutralize resistance, that disarm yes. people and help them get on board both intellectually and emotionally. Right, right. Yeah. And it really can accelerate change, right? And not only accelerate change, but also grow the both the capability and the capacity for change. You know, a lot of organizations pride themselves in, in change, but what they're experiencing is chaos. Chaos is not the same thing as being change agile. Chaos, what, what it produces, and it can produce, and I've seen this in, in some organizations, it can produce a sense of numbness, and it immobilizes people because people don't know which way to go. Right. Whereas change agility creates direction and acceleration and, of course, performance. And so that's very... Being change agile is very different than thriving in chaos or living in chaos. Marcelino, I can't thank you enough for your distilled wisdom based on your years and years as a practitioner. Immensely helpful. Thank you, Tim. So for any of you who are listening, who are practitioners, who are in change, who are in the trenches, in the throes of leading a change initiative of one kind or another, I hope that you can see that the change management is an applied discipline. And Marcelino, thank you so much for being on the podcast. This was incredible. Thank you, Tim. This has been fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for joining me today on the Culture by Design podcast. Be sure to subscribe and listen to new episodes every week. And if you'd like to see more of the work we're doing, go to leaderfactor.com.